I'm Nicholas Penny. It was several years ago that I started work on the Italian paintings of the 17th and 18th century in the Norton Simon Museum. And now that this splendid catalogue has been published, I'm celebrating with three short videos concerning some of the discoveries I made in the course of compiling the catalogue. When I began cataloguing the paintings of the 17th and 18th century in the Norton Simon Museum, I asked myself, are there any that I don't really like or that I'm not looking forward to investigating further? And the first category of painting that came to my mind was that of topography, paintings which record a particular place, because I often consider this type of painting somewhat boring. And I thought that the Antonio Ioli painting, The View of Paestum, would be a picture which would not ever really excite me. But then when I looked into, literally into the painting, at all the small and inconspicuous details in it, I began to realise how interesting it really was. And some aspects of the painting began to intrigue me, almost to keep me awake at night. One of the problems was, why do the tiny figures near these Greek temples carry torches, even by daylight? And after a great deal of thought, I decided that this must be to do with the fact that there were mosquitoes that needed to be repelled. And I began to read a great deal of literature on the travel in what were then remote parts of southern Italy in that period. And I began to appreciate far more the value of an image of this kind at that date. But this isn't the only topographical painting that I had to tackle. The most important of those was certainly Panini's view of the interior of St Peter's, an interior of the greatest church in Europe at the height of its magnificence, when it had really just been finished in every possible way in the 18th century. Now, most view paintings or topographical pictures in the 18th century, when they concern architecture, concern the outside of buildings, as, for example, in the view paintings of Canaletto, which is a very fine example in the collection. It's much rarer to see the interior view. And it is, in fact, as anyone who's tried to photograph such a view knows it very, very difficult to convey all the information that someone might really want about such a building. And it's not a bad way to begin to think about the great Panini view of St Peter's by reference to photographic reproductions that you may even have taken yourself, by which I think you will always be somewhat uh, disappointed. First of all, you won't be able to float up into the air to take a view of an interior in this way. You can't work out where Panini is, but he's certainly not on ground level. And then you will be naturally inclined to have the centrepiece of the whole basilica, the wonderful golden glass behind the altar at the far, far end of the building, in the very centre of your view. Panini is very careful not to do that because by having it the vanishing point towards which our eyes are drawn off centre, he's able to show a little glimpse of the magnificent crossing of St Peter's with its huge statues in four niches. You can only see one of those statues, but it gives you an idea that they must continue. Also, you're able to see into one of the aisles with the side chapels that go off it. In other words, you understand so much more about the building. And indeed, there are no photographic representations of the interior of St Peter's that can compete with this image. So that's one way of thinking about it, is to think about it in relation to the photography that has replaced view painting. But there's another way, and that's to think about what it is 
that Benini has added. And the most obvious thing here is that he's added the figures. The figures must all have been invented by him, although he's very careful to represent all the different types of activity and all the different types of people who might have been found in the Basilica in his lifetime. So it was, as a huge church, a place in which a certain amount of socialising could legitimately take place. You'll see a group of ladies and gentlemen in the foreground on the right, and beyond them another group which is centred round a visiting cardinal. And cardinals did, of course, play a very important part in the running of the Church of the Vatican, which was adjacent to St Peter's, and did make ceremonial visits to the Basilica. Right in the foreground, though, are two kneeling figures, and they're really essential to um, give you an introduction into the picture space. And they are in the traditional costumes of the Campania. I mean, they come from the countryside outside Rome, and they're making a pilgrimage to this great building, where, of course, they will be welcome. Slinking off on the far left of the painting is a woman with a dark shawl looking rather apprehensively around at us. And she must be someone who's done something really terrible. She's a penitent lady, and and she's being rather furtive because she doesn't want people to know about the penitence, the long prayers, perhaps, that she is here to make. Normally, any lady will, of course, be accompanied either by some form of chaperone or by a female servant of some kind, or, of course, by a gentleman, and you'll see that elsewhere as well. Notice how important the figures are for conveying exactly how large the basilica is, but also how great a distance you have to cover before you even get to the crossing, just before you get to the crossing, just in front of that large statue occupying the niche. It's a statue of St Helena, In front of that, there's a tiny profile man, like the size of an ant, and he is, in fact, engaged in kissing the toe of the statue of St Peter, which was a very important part of the basilica and a very important ritual that many visitors then and today enact in this great building, so that the toe itself has been very much worn away by successive acts of osculation. And one last point that I'd like to make, which has made me so much more aware of the artistic character of this great painting. Think about the colours which are worn by the figures, and you'll find a predominance of yellows and pale browns and russety reds. These colours, of course, must have corresponded to the sorts of colours that people would have worn when visiting the Basilica in the 18th century. But they're also very subtly related to the colour of the alabasters and marbles and gilding that you see in the basilica itself. They've somehow been chosen to give an additional harmony to this astonishing painting.